it's a pleasure certainly to me to have the opportunity to introduce Professor David Hoosen. Professor David Hoosen is well known by his work at the University of Berkeley in California. He is well known by his studies on the geography of the Soviet Union and the evolution of geography in the Soviet Union. I think that all the geographers who have been an interest in the history of geography have the opportunity to meet him. They are all in depth to the way he tries to develop the relations between the different schools. And so it's really a pleasure to introduce me, to introduce this geographer who is a world citizen and at the same time a world geographer. So, David, it's such a pleasure for me to have this interview that I think that some recollections of your youth in Wales will be perhaps uh, pleasant for me and useful for the public since you get so many things, so many ideas, so many experiences from this past period. Yes, I think that's, that's often true and true in my case that early experiences, even though I didn't of course realize it at the time, were quite important and I was brought up in a uh, on a farm, a uh, rather intensive, rather innovative uh, farm with very hard work in a valley in Wales, a rather isolated uh, valley. And I did get the experience through my hands and feet of what uh, land and life and connections between them is, uh, is all about at a microcosmic uh, level. But also it was the period of the 30s and I was constantly made aware through the unemployment uh, and the depression, the low prices and so on, um, of the importance of the worldwide situation, which has never left me. And at that time, um, I was most interested in the different ways in which people um, in different countries were trying to organize the land and the areas. For instance, uh, it was Roosevelt's time with the New Deal, and very exciting, of Stalin's transformation of nature, Hitler's uh, Lebensraum and so on. All of that interested me as a, as a small boy, the, the cultural context and the international situation. Uh, but at the same time, this is, uh, experience in the valley was very claustrophobic because it was a very enclosed world in its way. Uh, and I didn't feel like settling down to farming for life, although I could have done so. Um, and so therefore I was uh, very glad to be whisked away at the age of 17 to o Oxford University um, <coughs> to do geography. I should say uh, that I had met, while a boy, um, a very remarkable figure, H.J. Uh, Fleur, and then Professor of Geography and Anthropology and formerly Biology uh, in the University of Wales and Manchester, who uh, impressed me very much uh, as a charismatic figure and as somebody who advised me and excited me into geography. And he's just one, I think, of a number of geographers. He was from the Channel Islands, who you might say have come from the Celtic fringe of Britain uh, not excluding, of course, uh, Anne Batima, uh, and which have had a disproportionate uh, diaspora um, all over the world, perhaps uh, disproportionate to their uh, to their size. But, uh, yes. So your first experiences was in a kind of periphery, yes. and before completing your studies, I think that the war opened new new experiences elsewhere in the world. Yes. Well, that's true. Very early on, after my uh, one year in Oxford at a very early age, when I was exposed to uh, uh, geography as an academic subject for the first time, uh, with Mackinder still alive there, and Gilbert, who was my tutor, who later became professor, um, the idea of um, uh, even geography as a, as a uh, an old science 
as well as the world view, and of course it was in the middle of the war, you see, so that world geopolitics were crowding in everywhere, the global view. War uh, is a great teacher of geography. In, in my entire teenage years, in fact, were spent in a state of war. And uh, um, the, the world is a matter of life and death in questions relating to geography, as a matter of fact. So geopolitical situation. Yes, but, but reality is everywhere, yes. And an experience too of the tropical countries and Well I was I was sent out um, as a as a weather forecaster in the Navy to um, India and and Malaya, Ceylon in the nineteen forty four for two years. And that was a tremendous experience for me. Uh, so different the richness, the cultural richness, the population problems, the sort of colonial economies there, and of course the very different physical environment, which really, um, really impressed me and opened up the new world to me, which had formerly been very confined in that small island and small valley. So when re you resume your studies at the yeah. university, it was with a different perspective, I suppose. It was a very different perspective, and yet in the Britain to which I returned, it was still a very poor, well, it was an austerity country. It had uh, was uh, losing its empire. Um, it was very difficult to get money to, to work in the rest of the world, so I settled down to uh, work on... Uh, a PhD on the British subject, in fact with Michael Wise, who later became president of IGU and many other things, um, and uh, took a job at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. But it was very much working on British subjects and retreating into localism, perhaps, uh, until I did get um, um, a chance to go overseas again in 1956. And I think that this year was particularly significant for your life and for your ideas. It's for you a kind of change in all the fields I got. Yes, that's right. 1956, if you remember, was a very uh, important year in many ways in the world because um, it was the year of Suez and the, perhaps the end really of the beginning of the end of the empires and the old structure uh, that I had been brought up with. Uh, and also in Russia, um, there was this uh, great upsurge with Khrushchev uh, denouncing Stalin and a new uh, reform there. So that Russia became all of a sudden, uh, and with the Sputnik, um, became a world power and also within itself became very interesting because it was changing so much uh, compared with what it had been. So at the time, I, um, what um, I'd always been interested in Russia, among other places, but hadn't had the opportunity to study it. I felt I knew it completely from the campaigns of the war, of course. Um, but w I got the opportunity, an offer to go to Washington um, to um, build up a study, uh, build up an expertise on the geography of the Soviet Union, which I accepted. And so all at once, um, I changed my um, an extension of my world view, you might say, the canvas of my experience, um, to studying this huge country of the Soviet Union just emerging uh, from uh, and you were in a position to compare yes. the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The United States was also new to me, so that, uh, and it was just the time when the whole idea of the superpowers competing and being compared in many ways was coming uh, very suddenly, with the Sputnik in particular, coming to a head. And the Americans were suddenly very hungry for all information about the Soviet Union which they had been very ignorant about. So the few years you spent in Washington, D.C. and yes. at the University of Maryland yes. were very productive for you. They were very productive indeed, largely due to the Library of Congress. Where I had learned Russian on my own and got access to a very rich store of very exciting materials, which I was unprepared for about what was happening in the Soviet Union in that middle, late 50s 
period where everything was changing and where there was, quite apart from changes in the whole country, which I wrote about in, in some books, um, in terms of the country itself, that Soviet geographers were engaged, as I found, and nobody seemed to know about that, were engaged in a very uh, important and very uh, sharp arguments on ideological, doctrinal, philosophical grounds about geography and the way it should go. So it was at that time that your interest, interest in the history of geography began to grow? Yes, I think that's really true. I had been interested before, but what I discovered was that um, this, these arguments in the Soviet Union, for instance, were really related very much to a rich body of tradition going back to the Tsarist times, which the, Rus the Soviet Russians were very proud of and were harking back to, and which were unknown uh, among geographers in the West, or seemed to be either unknown or forgotten completely. And so at that time you were still a young man and you moved to West. Yes. And I think that it was important for you to, in some sense. Well, yes, there again, a change in a sort of world view and, and, and uh, location uh, did follow from the fact that I left the east coast of the United States in 1960 and have been resident on the Pacific coast for the last uh, quarter century. Uh, first for a few years in uh, British Columbia, but for the last 20 years in uh, Berkeley. Uh, and that has had, a, I think, a major effect on my positioning of myself in relation to the world, as well as being a very pleasant place to work from the physical and cultural point of view and intellectual. So it means that all the geography you are practicing is linked to the, card, the, to the views of the world you have perceived and developed at the different yes, um, stages of your life. Well, I think I have to, to believe that, yes, and I've been very lucky, I think, to, um, because I do have had a thirst to find out about the world and not to be confined to just a part of it, uh, to move to from one different world to another. And it so happens that the Pacific world has been, in the last 20 years, as you know, has been growing relatively very much in significance compared with the Atlantic world. And I think that in Berkeley, yeah. you have also responsibilities which gave you the opportunity to meet a lot of social scientists. And so your view on the relations of geography and the social sciences is certainly richer than the view of other geographers. Well, it's true that I was uh, for some years the Dean of Social Sciences in Berkeley, which is a very large group of um, prima donnas, uh, very often, uh, from nine departments of the social sciences, of which geography is one of the smaller. And it was interesting that, partly because um, the other social science uh, professors were very ignorant of geography, not prejudiced against it, but it had not, had, had not been part of their experience. And so in making polite conversation, they would always um, ask about it. And they mostly were educated in Harvard and Stanford and Yale and such places, which do not now have geography. And um, yet they would get very interested in it when they knew what it was about. It was just ignorant. And they were interested in the relationships between it and their own social science. But the social science was a very broad um, group of uh, people and departments then, going from linguistics to history to uh, uh, psychology and, of course, economics, sociology, political science, and so on. And it was where geography fitted that was interesting to me. I found that um, more and more the way the uh, trends were going that I felt more comfortable with um, historians, uh, anthropologists, even linguists sometimes, than with economists who were becoming very theoretical and, and statistical, um, and sociologists. 
And so therefore, it helped me to establish a, a place in my mind for geography in relation to the social sciences there. And I think that out of these different types of experience, the view of problems of geopolitics, your experience of relations with the other social sciences, you developed a view of geography as a kind of philosophy. Yes. Well, I think that's, that's true, and I think I have to thank uh, many people for that, starting perhaps with Fleur and uh, Gilbert, uh, in different ways, felt that way. And uh, the very formative influence for me as an undergraduate of, of finding and reading Maurice Lelanou's book, La Géographie Humaine, which struck me, and he, he I think, uh, described geography as a kind of philosophy of man as an inhabitant of the earth. And to me, that made great sense in its breadth and in its questions. And when I spent 10 years in very close quarters with Carl Sauer in Berkeley at the last uh, decade of his life, that also, his view, which again was different, um, was also um, very much congenial to that idea of a philosophy of man as a transformer of the earth and as an inhabitant of the earth, bringing in the historical approach all the time. So it satisfied me, then, yes. uh, more or less. And I think that as the head of the Commission of the History of Geographical Thought, you have the opportunity to compare the people and to meet the people who are practicing the history of geography. And perhaps it is worth to ask you what are the kind of experiences you have in this role? and what had the kind of lessons you can draw out of your experience at the head of this commission? Well, I, f I have found it very satisfying um, and helpful, really. Uh, for one thing, I've never wanted to be confined to a single nation in terms of traditions and so on, find it more comfortable uh, and much more stimulating to meeting people from different countries. Uh, but more than that, it's reassuring and helpful because um, geographers sometimes can become very lonely in their country and in the United States, um, geography uh, has this lack of recognition which goes down to the schools and uh, uh, there are certain problems there and I find that it's very stimulating to find out what successes, achievements, and problems uh, geographers have had in other countries and at different times. That it, this makes one more able to assess the problems and the opportunities of the United States or wherever one had to be at the, at the time. And uh, I would think that um, the um, process of thinking internationally about such a very international subject as geography, which is nothing if not a world subject, really, but at the same time has, is infused with the uh, traditions and the environment and the experience of particular people in particular places, inevitably making French geography rather different from Russian geography, American geography, in various ways. That this is very interesting and also instructive and that I just rather like this um, international approach, which t I think ties up with the global approach that I've tried to develop in political and regional geography and so on. And what are the views you have on the future of geography? Well, I am, I, am, I think, like you, a mitigated optimist. There are certainly problems in the United States, in particular, which go back to the schools. Uh, but my feeling is that um, uh, in all countries, uh, with the world getting much more shrunken, that the problems are becoming more and more geographical in the sense of requiring geography to attend to their solution. And also that people are really curious about the world and the way it's developed and that this will not go away and that geographers are the ones, ideally, to supply that if we can do it if we can maintain contact with the public, the educated public, which is 
uh, in my opinion, the most important thing to do, and to strive for a certain simplicity uh, and um, a, um, a synthetic uh, literary point of view which will bring in the modern methods as they are appropriate, but which has a vitality uh, and which people want to read. So thank you very much, Professor Hussen. It was a pleasure to have this interview, and I think it's really significant for the students to listen to this kind of developments on the, your experience of life, of the world, and of geography. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah.